So I wanted to thank the organizer of this symposium for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I always love Vienna, and so every single time it's a pleasure to come back and visit, and especially this time to share some of the work that we have been working on. Uh, it really, it's, uh, it's all related to creating uh, you know, realistic, immersive virtual environment. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that I have done really started uh, from my career at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and I am also currently an Amazon scholar working there part time uh, to help transitioning some of the work that we have done into real product. And I'm currently at University of Maryland at College Park. I had a distinctive pleasure as also serving as department chair for a few years. Um, so I have seen all kind of interesting administrative you know, perspective as well. So this, this work is all done over the last, um, you know, few years. Uh, it's, although that it started and booted from decades at UNC, uh, focusing on immersive uh, virtual environments. And it has continued, but it's taking a slightly different flavor and trying to tackle some of the problem, which I think are really critical and important. And I have the pleasure to share with them, um, with you today. And I'm hoping that, you know, some, I'm going to cover some of the work by other groups as, as well. And I'm hoping to sort of stimulate some interesting discussions and possible collaboration after this. Um, virtual reality or virtual environment really is a concept that has been, um, conceived even way back about five, more than five decades ago by Evan Sutherland in 1965. It says that uh, the ultimate dis display referring to AR VR is a looking glass. Uh, into a mathematical wonderland. If the task of the display is to serve as a looking glass into the mathematical wonderland, constructed in computer memory, this is really important, it should serve as many senses as possible. And humans have multiple senses. One of the dominant sense is our visual. And obviously others are equally important, including haptic, um, our sense of touch, and also auditory, um, our hearing and sound. And, and then there are many, many other, you know, like tastes and so on. Um, so, so this is really embodied the concept, which at least I personally and many of you here I know have worked on. And, um, and this is a journey. And it, the journey is still ongoing and there are a lot of really exciting, uh, places that we have stopped. And I'm hoping to continue on this journey and I'm hoping to see this taking all the work that we have done into the metaverse. And I'll come back and talk about that in just a few minutes. So, if you look into Wikipedia, it has this similar kind of definition like immersive multimedia computer simulated reality. It replicates an environment that simulate, again, a physical presence in place in the real world or imagined world, which is the cool part, right? Is that we can recreate possibly a, a physical world and be able to add elements to it and allow the user to interact with that world. So VR artificially creates sensory presence and experiences that can include touch, sight, hearing, and smell. Um, oops, I am so sorry. I'm not using my own computer, so um, hit the wrong button. Uh, extension of VR, um, including things many of us we also know, which is, for example, augmented reality. It's a direct or indirect view of the physical and real world environment and components and element whose element are then augmented and supplemented by the computer generated sensory input of visual and audio and graphics. So AR, I think, is a form of a VR that many of us have already experienced. Uh, if you haven't played some of these Pokemon game, you, 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 you'll know. Uh, <laughs> you should try. Um, and, and, you know, there are other forms like MR, which is merging the real and the virtual world to produce a new environment and so on. Um, I apologize. Uh, sorry. This is, um, I should not touch this laptop. <laughs> I should just use my thing here. Okay. Um, so AR, VR, MR today is what Facebook likes to call as metaverse is one of the most disruptive technology for the next decade and decades to come. And it's projected to produce millions and millions of dollars um, and the application of metaverse are limitless. Of course, Facebook as a social media company is thinking to bring all of us through metaverse to interact and socialize with each other. Why not? Imagine that, you know, taking your parents or your grandparents who can travel with you 
but they can communicate and see what you're experiencing through the metaverse, through the Facebook. Um, and, and, and so it's really one of the possible technology vehicle that can introduce interaction that otherwise would not be possible. And there are many, many important problems, uh, technology problems that are still yet to be solved, but yet they have already been worked on and a lot of progress has already been made. I, I would say, you know, being previously at UNC for 20 years, I have seen great advances that has already been made uh, on low latency, large area tracking. It is possible today, even commercially, uh, through Oculus VR. And we also have seen all forms of an immersive display. Hand mount display is very immersive. When I put on hand mount display, I am transported to a different world. But that's not the only one. Um, there's also projector-based display, wall size display, all kinds of display, desktop display. And interactive 3D graphics is also an area which many of us have also worked on. And all the advances and the research we have done are critical. They are what enable us to create a metaverse of today and tomorrow. Now, you can't do all this without actually create and model and simulate emotion like Marie Paul has been sh showing us earlier. All that is cr it's critical. The world we live in, it's not static, it's dynamic. And so to have all these interaction and these motion and elements that move and interact with us, that we can change, that we can edit, that we can alter, is an important part of this immersive experience. Now, as a haptic person, I'm still a haptic person. I have spent, you know, years working on haptic, and this is related to touching able feedback. Just think what we do on a day-to-day basis. How can we get away without the sense of touch? I would argue the first thing you do when you get out of your bed, trying to open a door, you can't do it without touch. And so that sense of touch, is just a critical element of our day-to-day -day life. So you should also be part of, of our experience in the metaverse. And last but not least, this is audio. Watch a movie without a song. How would that experience be like? <laughs> it's like a movie. You can't imagine anything, even without a subtext, even worse, right? So if you don't have an audio transcription, it's really hard to understand. So if we live in a silent world, it will be a very, very different experience. So all these elements, and I have also worked on audio, and, and we actually had a startup company that was very luckily acquired by Valve. And so the library that we have created is now, if you are using Valve's uh, Steam engine, you're probably using our song engine as well. Um, so these are sort of some of the, all the important area. But today I'm not gonna talk about all those things that, um, that you know, a lot of advances has been worked on, has been made. I'm going to talk a, a bit about how did we build this virtual environment by capturing the real world through physical interaction with them. And I view this as a really critical element. A metaverse is not a metaverse if there is not a setting and an environment that we can interact with. And if we want to do the experiment, the virtual experiment, like Marie Paul has shown us, we have to capture them first. Um, and, and this is... I'm sorry. Um, this is the process, what I call creating the metaverse. This is the authoring process. How do we bring the re real world, the physical world into our metaverse so that we can interact with it, how we can augment it, we can change it, we can alter it, we can ask the what if question. Um, and, and this is precisely what, you know, what we are interested in doing ultimately. Um, and then obviously, if you are experiencing this world, the real world, you will also like to share that experience through the metaverse with your loved one or friends or families. Um, and so it, it is important to think about the capturing problem and the reconstruction problem. And I want to say in computer graphics and visualization, the, co the construction problem, the reconstruction problem, it's not a new problem. There has been probably over five decades of work that has been done in this area. Many people in visualization have looked at it. Um, the seminal work of Marching Cube by Lorenzen, that is really a, a, a milestone that made it possible to take all these medical images and CT images and all kind of scientific images and convert them to 3D models. There are also many other work that has appeared in SIGGRAPH even recently that talk about how do you reconstruct shape, how do you classify object, um, and, and so on. So there has been a lot of work on geometric reconstruction. Um, also, in the larger scale of scene reconstruction, you can imagine that these are some, still some of the, the work, even way back in the 90s, my colleagues, uh, Henry Fuchs's group, uh, yeah, really like pioneering the concept of office of future. How do you bring the world that you see in the offices that you have and share that through tele-immersion, 
with someone else is on the other side. And this is a very different methodology because it, it's done through projection-based um, display without really reconstructing the geometry, but through projecting the images and sharing that experience. Um, and then even more recently, I have picked these two couple work, um, not because there has not been a lot of work, there's gazillions of work on scene reconstruction, but I do want to kind of share and contrast the different approach. So we have this projection-based display approach that is a way of doing scene reconstruction. We also have the more recent work that is really looking at scanning the images, scanning the data, creating a deep neural network, and be able to you know, generate a scene this way. And that's a very much a learning-based algorithm. I'm sorry. Um, oh, so some of my colleagues and friends have also looked look at the image and video reconstruction and multi-view geometry reconstruction. And here are some of the work but we are now going way beyond just video and image reconstruction. We are now coming down to bodies, human hands, ears, gestures. And, and these are all very, very exciting directions. And most recently, there is just a buzz about NERF. And if you haven't heard about it, you want to read up about it. Um, it's the neural radiance field. And I just submitted a paper on that topic yesterday. Um, so this is, this is a way of actually leveraging neural network and it's capturing the radiance of a scene. Uh, and they call it a radiance field. Um, and you can generate these photorealistic images. And there are issues, however, computation is a problem. And you don't know exactly what the black box is doing. That's another issue. And that's one of the things Marie Paul referred to. But this also provides a really, really interesting direction because it allows us to actually now capture the world and, and, and be able to display them and render them and visualize them realistically. Um, and then I'm an animation simulation person, so I can't go without saying and acknowledge other than the static scenes, other than the radiance fields, other than the lighting and the images that we see, we also do a lot, a lot of motion capture and control over the, the few decades. Uh, I just pick a few work that demonstrate, you know, motion graphs, uh, learning from capture or simulate emotions. Uh, these are a few really important, interesting work that I personally really like, but they are, they are not you know, limited by any sense. There are many, many more, and there are probably thousands and thousands of paper. So to summarize, really, data that capture the physical world we live in come in all shape of forms and different types of data. We have seen 2D images, photographs, drawing, painting. We also have seen 3D geometry and model that are either scanned um, or you know, sampled. And then we, we have mocap data that are arbitrary high dimensional and also audio and videos. And one of the things we don't talk too much and we don't think about a lot is the medical information. This are going to include things like CT scans, ultrasound images, MRI images, but even patient records, information like your age, your weight, your height, all those are important. Um, and then in addition to that, you have sensor data that are embedded in the environment. And, and I think increasingly we are worried about climate change, we are worried about environment, we are worried about planting, agriculture planting, all these kind of information that we would like to get and visualize and plan lives in various forms of sensor data. Lastly, but not the least, is there are so many other types of data like documents, social media, web information. All these are trove of data that we can exploit and that we haven't really, um, you know, really exploit and think about how we can take advantage of all these data that surrounds us. So what are the challenges? Well, obviously many of us who work in this area, um, I have seen so many friends here, and I know many of you have all worked on many of these data sets as I do, um, and, and probably much more than I do. Uh, in terms of the diversity of the data representation and format, we are seeing 2D, 3D versus undimensional. We are seeing text, numbers, images, videos, audios, and even abstract data sets. But we are also seeing a host of really tangible information like geometry. I, 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 I am a geometry person, I'm also a physics person, um, and, and increasingly I recognize the, the power of visualization, the appearance, the optics matters, and most of all, as we move into the new century, we also need to remember, and uh, of, of course in the metaverse, the human is in the middle of all. <laughs> After all, we are creating a technology for a human. So we need to think about how do we model human behavior as well, um, and then be able to capture that. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of challenges we're dealing with, including noises, uncertainties, and 
most of all, incompleteness of the data, because a lot of data we capture are not complete. Um, so I'm going to just talk about there are, you know, many, many problems. And to, in contrast to many of the reconstruction work, I'm going to talk a bit about three separate different areas. I'm going to talk about example in soft bodies, which I have been involved. And this will include human tissues, human bodies, and clothes. And again, very human-centric, right? Uh, it's all about us. <laughs> Uh, it's about us humans. And then I'm going to talk about multi-agent system, which again, will include crowds, traffic, uh, but I'll also just kind of generalize and talk about insects and birds and animals and how these system, um, these concepts are generalized to them as well. Um, but last but not least is multimodal display. As someone who have done both haptics and song, I truly believe multimodal displays are critical. And so I'll show a little bit of example on what, what has been done there and what can be done more. Okay, tissue. They're actually having a lot of work on tissue reconstructions. Um, I'm coming in from a slightly different angle to talk about our work. Um, and this is really has a personal touch. Actually, I got into this research when my dad had prostate cancer. And, um, you know, I wasn't much a medicine person. I, I learned and read of everything uh, about prostate cancer when he had prostate cancer. So I found that prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in men in the U.S. I would imagine a similar statistic worldwide. And, and there was no standard or routine screening test. Uh, I was surprised. Palpation in a doctor's office, blood tests um, for antigen um, are sort of kind of standard and routine. And that's one of the reasons that most of people discover them fairly late. Um, and the good thing is it's a very slow progressing disease. And the real sure way to determine the stage and the severeness of the, the, the cancer is through biopsy. And we might think biopsy is some golden tool. It isn't. Uh, what I found was the biopsy samples were taken randomly from the patient's organ as well. Um, so they really, that's an area where a lot more progress can be made. Um, the treatment is just radiotherapy or surgery. Neither option is pleasant. So we can kind of thinking about this as an NIH funded project. And we've been, we, we look at, you know, if we have all these medical images, can we do more? Can we be more preventive in, you know, catching it early on and, and do things about it? So we, we, we have this project that where we were given a set of medical images of the patient as you monitor them. Um, and, and the idea there is we want to do cancer prognosis and, and treatments and, and perhaps pre-op planning and, and training and ultimately be able to use some of these technology, develop surgical training and robots um, to, to do, you know, to help improving healthcare service. And so basically what we did there is we look at the medical images and we extract information directly from the me medical images. What we extracted are the tissue elasticity information of the patient. So this is actually patient-specific information. Then we perform some data analytic and predict the model. Um, then we can do, we can do classifications, um, clinical classification to try to determine what cancer stage um, and how aggressive the, the, the disease is. And I won't go into the detail for the approach, but very high level, given that we have two or more sets of images, what we can do is reconstruct the 3D geometry. All the work that we have done in the past um, is what we build this on. But based on two instances in time and the organ shape, we could then try to guess how the tissue or the whole entire organ deform. And we are assuming a few boundary conditions like the bone around it, uh, the body of cavities, and so on. So those are our constraints. Then we perform parameter estimation to estimate as we deform from one set of organ to, uh, to another set of organ and see how the tissue deform. And we estimate, we try to change the parameter, the tissue parameter, and deform the tissue and, and do the simulation with a couple of simulation optimization to figure out what would be the appropriate parameters. And this is a couple loop. It will stop when the parameter we guess actually produce the kind of deformation that we see from set one to set two. Um, so how good was it? Um, this is obviously taking advantages of a lot of simulation technology, a lot of visualization technologies. And we took these patient-specific uh, elasticity tissue property. We plotted against two things, the Gleason score and the cancer stage. Cancer stage is the staging, disease staging um, numbers you get from the doctor's office. And the Gleason score is what you get from the biopsy. And so arguably, Gleason score should be more accurate. Uh, but what was interesting was we see a strict a linear correlation for the cancer staging. That means that we are doing just as well as a doctor. 
by palvation. Um, and then when we look at the Gleason score, we also saw the linear correlation as well. We then performed the T-stage classification using different classification methods. And you can see, if we condition on the age, age is important because our tissue property change over time and change over our age. And if we do that, we find that we actually have up to 91% um, of correlation between the tissue property and the T-stage classification. And one off, this is distance of one, that's like one stage off. Um, and so this was incredible good uh, classification. That means that even when we did not have a per perfect staging, we have pretty much close to the actual stage. Um, and even without the age information, we're still doing about 89% of stage, uh, you know, stage prediction, T-stage prediction. Um, now, when it comes to Gleason score, um, it did not do as well as a T stage, but it still did fairly well. It achieved up to about 88% of accurate prediction with age and 81% without. So this is where um, the age information really made a difference. And again, we look at when we did not do it right, how far we are off, one off, you can see. Um, they are, however, on a slightly different scale. T stage is 0, 1, 2, 3, and the Gleason score is, is it's on 0, 1 all the way to 9. Um, so, so this is less, actually, less difference than you might think because it's on oh, practically a 10 scale. So we did pretty well on the Gleason score classification as well. So that was really, really encouraging. It kind of tells us that as we expected, that the, um, the tissue property do correlate. Um, and, and they are predictive of cancer uh, progression and staging. So we want to be able to do visualization and simulation person. We drop different kind of organ onto a Petri dish just to see how they bounce. My joke is, is don't do this at home. Um, but <laughs> you can visualize how the different organ might, might bounce differently. And when you touch it, a healthy and unhealthy prostate can clearly vi is visible. But it's not only applicable to prostate. We can do this to cardiograph as well. And I uh, also joke, if you want to try to decide whether you should throw away those tennis balls that you bought for your kids, this is also very good technology, all right? So it, the technology is generalizable to other kind of elastic material as well. So future research directions. Well, um, we, I believe we, what we have done here is we're saying, let's go beyond geometry. Let's look into the physics. Look at the material property. How can this information be really useful? And can we use that for various type of application? And we, sh we show and demonstrate in medical application. Um, one going into the future is we do need these material for all kind of medical simulator and, and more. I'm going to show you more example. Um, what, what it's really kind of interesting here is we have only tested on prostate. We have not gone to other kind of tissues and, and there are some challenges as well. What if you have the organ being cut and tear? Uh, and torn, and there's a change in topology involved, how would you deal with that? How do you deal with modeling of frictional contact and bodily fluid? And can we use multimodal image data to do better cancer prediction? Last but not least, as I already alluded to, the biopsy usually is performed by random sampling of the tissue. Can we use these reconstructed images with the information about the tissue stiffness and be able to project such images onto the patient's body and thereby using AR basis biopsy to achieve better sampling of the tissue when you do biopsy. Now, going into the next, it's human body. And we all know we are, we are not going to have a metaverse with human, without human, right? So there is a tremendous interest, and has always been, a tremendous interest on creating digital avatars. And uh, there has been a lot of work that has been done, uh, particularly uh, Michael Black's school in Germany has been scanning in large numbers, thousands of bodies, and they have also been looking at, you know, scanning in hands and, and foot and so on. And so these are increasingly a really important area that many of us are also working on, and that is how do you create a digital avatar that's going to be based on this large database, a body that has been scanned. Um, and there has been a model called Simple that was being uh, constructed and proposed that some of us are also taking advantage of it. Um, so there, you know, this, this is continued to be a really hot area, an interesting area. Ourselves have also been looking at this and we are, we have proposed a shape aware human pose and shape reconstruction. For human body, it's not just the body shape, but also the poses matters. Um, and, and we've been looking at this not from just a single view, uh, we are also looking at it, what happens if we have multiple view? And we don't want a lots, lots of view because too many images, 
you have a lot more to process. We're talking about two to three, four views. And we have proposed this uh, neural network that actually have one stagger regression block uh, for each one of the image, process them, but we also shear the camera parameters and some of the body shape parameters across the network. And so multiple view have a way of reinforce and adjust and, and, and improve the prediction and the reconstruction of human body. What we found that was interesting was that, um, that our methods outbeat the other previous work, um, particularly on a non-standard human shape. And part of the reason is um, a lot of these body that were scanned are based on st standard body size. And so definitely pe that body shape that are outside the standard size, it's a lot more difficult to reconstruct using SMPL model. And so our methods wing right there when you have multiple perspective, you have better way to correct it. Um, but why are we doing the human body? Well, part of the reason we, we were doing body, human body reconstruction for our own application was shopping. Um, so my graduate student and I, uh, we both are lazy. We don't like to shop. And I hate to tell you I'm wearing clothes from like decades ago. Uh, you probably don't believe me, but I really hate shopping. And part of it is I just don't have time. And so we love to be able to shop. And I don't know how many of you are in the same situation as I am. Um, I give credit card to my daughter and they will spend a few hundred dollars. And guess what? 90% of those don't fit. And you have to return. And as a mom who had to pay all those credit card bills, thinking, can we improve the shopping experience? And the biggest thing is fitting, um, how well you fit. Uh, and this is a problem that many people in computer graphics has been working on, and also in VR. Uh, there's this concept of a virtual try-on. And, uh, and, and here are some of the uh, papers that really focus on simulation. Um, some of these works are absolutely phenomenal. You can, you can see some of these photographs look like they're all computer-generated images. And they're generated by simulating fiber interactions in, in one example. And in some of the examples, you can see the patterns of these fabrics. Um, and, and they look really, really nice and really, really, really realistic. Um, and so the goal there is if we could do virtual try-on. We can have the digital representation and be able to try it on our own body. Wouldn't that be cool? You don't have to go to the virtual to the try-on room anymore. Um, and and so this this has been sort of the motivation for some of the work which I'm about to talk about. So motivation is online shopping. Uh, you don't have to try gazillions of clothes. Uh, you know, in, in, in the in the clothes shops, and you don't have to go shopping. You can just shop from the comfort of your home in your pajama. So the apparel industry is estimated to be at about $3 trillion already in 2015. This was way before the pandemic with a growth rate about 4% per year. And the US market is one of the largest in the world. We consume a lot. I am probably one of the few who don't consume as much as the others because I'm too lazy to shop. So when I can do you e shopping, I probably would be shopping a lot more. Um, $1.6 trillion of retail purchasing was done via online and with a growth rate in a double digit. And Amazon done really well during pandemic, and as you can imagine. Uh, most of people doing uh, shopping at home. And so our vision here was, can we automatically predict the fit of the clothes on different poses and different body and under different shape and motions and sizes? And ideally, if we could do that, you know, that it's going to cut down a lot of ways. Just imagine all those return that you buy things, 90% you returned, the shipping costs, and, and Marie Paul is talking about the gasoline, the sh you know, that's even a large amount of a waste that's going on. You buy the stuff, return, go back and forth, the truck has to drive all those goods back and forth. So our motivation is really to reduce the return. And, but that's not the only reason um, that I'm talking about some of these work. The other thing is we are, we are expecting household robots going to be picking up things like folding clothes, doing things that you don't want to do. Um, and if the robot's going to fold clothes for you, you want a robot to be able to distinguish different kind of fabric and different material. And so those are some of the motivation. And ideally is that if I see something someone like, and I want to get that as a birthday present for my friend, and I know that um, you know, she was looking at the, 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 the top or my daughter and the skirt um, in, in this photograph in the middle B, and I have a picture of her. I could just try it on using that. 
I can use a picture to try to close on her. So that was our vision when we started this work. And in fact, this is pretty much what we did. Uh, we have the photographs um, of the person, and that's the original image on the left. We can automatically recover the body directly from the photograph. And then not only we can recover the body directly from the photograph, we can also recover the garments. So we can do this um, for different body, different clothes. And here are just sort of some of the earlier results. But the best part is you can also animate. You can lift the leg, um, and you can move, you can bend. Uh, if you're looking at sports clothes, you can also do try to see how loose the things will fit on you as you move. Um, and, and as I already mentioned, you know, if you have somebody's photographs, let's say you want to give them a surprise birthday present, this is what you can do. Take their photographs, dress it on with a catalog images. You can even change the color, and you can see how you will fit on an existing outfit. And so imagine this kind of capability is made available to you through online shopping portal. All right? So that is more or less the vision we have. And, and we have demonstrated that this is possible stepwise. So you see two model, the original one, the models um, was body was reconstructed, clothes, the garment was reconstructed, but then we tried on a different body through the photograph try on. Uh, but the best part is it's not an image-based try on. It's actually doing everything in 3D. So you can even turn around. So this is some other photographs of the body of the lady on by the beach. And we let her try on the long skirt. And we can see how you look like as the wind blow. OK, so that, is, that was one of the earlier work that we have started. But we also looking into, well, can we also, other than image-based approach, can we also take advantage of videos? And so we've been looking at applying technique like this and to use neural network, um, including a combination of CNN plus LSTM, a combination of network where the CNN is used to extract the image features. And those image features are then piped through and being used for tracking for LSTM, which had the memory of the motion. Um, and then you can classify different uh, fabric material. We Many of the video that we were able to get are just single piece of cloth. In order to address that problem, we use simulation and to generate all kind of simulated data where we know the ground truth parameter of the material. And here is some example of real to virtual transfer. On the left is the recorded real fabric. On the right is the recovered fabric. So it's a real to virtual transfer. This is what I started talking about. On the, on the left, it's a real fabric material. We show you how you will look if it's being dressed as a skirt on the right. OK, so and again, it's the same kind of scenario here. You have a real piece of fabric. You transferred it onto the virtual skirt, and you can see how you will flow. So you can imagine this could be really useful. If you have some fabric that you like in the video that you have recorded, you could then um, figure out how that might look in the dresses or skirts or tops or shirts that you want. Um, so that was a direction. And to address the problem that which, you know, both Marie, Paul, and I, we, we talk about, which is this deep neural network are like black box. You don't know what's going on. And not only it, you don't know what's going on, it's throwing away century of work that we all have been working on building a model, a mathematical and analytical model for model the motion and dynamics of all different kinds of system. In this particular case, it's the cloth. So we have been, for the last five, six years, been looking at, is there a way we can combine data-driven based approach, like we already have through these deep neural network, and model-based approach, like many of us have worked on for you know at least decades, um, if not century. The mathematician proposed some of these models centuries ago. And they have their, how did they do this? Well, they, they run the experiment. They collect the data. They figure out what's the mathematical equation that fit the experimental result. That is what the deep neural network is doing, except it's using statistic. It's just a slightly different kind of math. The approaches are slightly different. But ultimately, if both approaches are valid, and which are they are, then they should reinforce each other. So the question there is, can we, is it possible to actually combine data-driven approach with model-based approach. And so this was sort of the direction that we've been kind of exploring. And the way that we do this is what we call developing a differentiable physics simulation, which I'm going to come back to the end and talk a little bit more as sort of like going forward to the future. 
Um, so we treat a differentiable physics simulation as a layer of the network. And this, if we do it this way, we compute the gradient of these physical systems. We can compute them. The gradient com contains so much information. And based on the gradients, we can feed it back to the network that will help us perform material estimation, motion control, model-based reinforcement learning, uh, property estimation, if you have any kind of physical property, also the control of a physical system. And so that's the big picture. Um, so that is basically what we did. And I'm not going to go into all the equation, but I just want to say what we end up doing here is transform all the sets of equation that you have seen from the Newton's dynamics, F equal to MA, rewrite it, rewrite the equation, derived um, the, you know, the, the equation, and we posed it as an optimization problem so that we can solve it using quadratic programming. Now, once we're posing this way, this is sort of kind of where we can compute the gradient and optimize and use a neural network to help us do the work. So we do have to derive the gradients. Um, and we, we send it through and we compare our approach versus the baseline. And we found we were able to achieve at least two orders of magnitude difference if we do it this way versus just pure data-driven approach of deep learning. OK, so this is showing by integrating analytical gradient information into a deep neural network, we can significantly speed up. And I also want to say, a lot of deep learning is just a lot of brute force computing. If we can reduce the compute, we are also creating a better environment for all of us because those energy bills not only expensive, it's actually not great right, for our environment. Um, and, and so this is a case where we have the, the material estimation for clothes. So why do we care about? fabric material estimation. Because without the fabric information, the clothes that we, want, that we wear will not look like the way it is. And in fact, different material um, feel very differently. So this is a very, very critical information for any kind of virtual trial. Um, so this is just a, a cute little demo where we show prior control methods was trying to take the clothes and drop it into the basket. It failed, but with ours, we can do it faster, and we can also achieve the task versus the baseline approach couldn't. All right, so now we have continued to work on this. And um, instead of using the differentiable physics, we are also looking at, um, can we use the videos? And we develop different kind of, if you have different image, if you have different input, you would need a slightly different architecture. Um, so we, we look at images as an input versus video as an input. In this particular work, we are looking at um, basically video as input. And videos is, as an input actually will give us much more richer information because it will show us how the uh, material or the fabric will move. Uh, over time and under different poses. And this is just to show you fabric matters. There is actually two different types of fabric there. Um, and, and the blue and the white, there are different fabric. I'm sorry, I just want to kind of come back here. So you can see, they are very different fabric and they do drape differently. Um, and in this particular work, again, what we did here is we take advantage of model-based approach to generate a whole bunch of simulation data. We recall I mentioned one of the problems for these data-driven based approach is the incompleteness of the data or insufficient data. So how do we make up for those missing data simulation? So if your model is reasonably accurate, you can run the simulation to generate a, the, the training data. And then you can train on this training data. Um, but to make sure that model is accurate enough, you need the simul you need a network to help you get all the parameter rise. So this is almost a reinforcement. It's kind of in the loop. We use the network to help us get a parameter and improve the model we have and all the parameter we need. Once we've done that, then we use the simulation results from that improved model we have, generate a simulation data to create scenarios that would, would otherwise not be possible to capture, and we use this data to train a network. And so this, in return, will improve the, the data-driven approach. OK. Um, so that's, that's really the general you know, philosophy here, is those two are not independent. They reinforce each other. And again, here we have material, and we show you how the material will look from real, uh, from real to virtual. And you're seeing the chrome material on the right as uh, this avatar dance. This, by the way, is a real-world example. This is my colleague, uh, Du Song. 
And I used him as a model so we can capture the t-shirt material. And we created that t-shirt. We capture the t-shirt material and use it in the Amazon t-shirt we sell on the web. Uh, yes. So this is all real story. Um, so you see that there, there are things we do in the lab and for research. They do feed into the real world. All right. Um, and, and these are just different try-on scenarios. Um, I'm just going to end right here. Um, these are really useful because it also allow us to, to generate different material um, as, comp as another way of doing computational material designs. And it allow us to explore the latent space of all different parameters. All right, I'm going to end right here. Um, and I'm going to just show you a couple examples on real t-shirts. You can buy them on the Amazon website. Um, so these are just a couple design, a couple different colors, and you can pick, and you can see how you look on you. We call it see it on me. Um, and why do we want to do this? Well, you want to know what size of t-shirt fits you. And this is a good visual. It's all synthetic, but the pattern is real. Um, so small t-shirt, medium t-shirt, and large t-shirt on the same person. The person's capture and reconstruct it using a single view photographs. And you can take two or three view to improve. But you can see it served the purpose. It's really helped you to see before you buy, what sizes do I really want? All right. And with this approach, um, what we have here, it outperforms all the prior work in, in different matrix, but also it, it's very important. It helps speeding up um, uh, the simulations. Uh, the try-on is actually also learning based. And again, you learn directly from the dynamics of the class simulation. And we try, we basically generate a large number about, you know, I won't go into tens of thousands of bodies of all different shape type. And then we try it on. And you can think of those simulation that we've done are interpolation key points. And we interpolate. As you try on, we capture your body. And we can interpolate in between. And it will show how the, the, the clothes will drape on you in real time. And this also is another way of getting by some of the problems. Sometimes the cost simulation or any physics simulation don't perform perfectly. And it could explode, potentially, if they run into a numerical problem. With a learning-based approach, you, you can kind of bypass some of these issues. Um, so I'll just show you really quick without going through too much of the video. Um, this is just a comparison of a different approach. So this is just to show we could also have this try on adopt to different poses so the body can move and you can see how the t-shirt will look on the body. And the another thing that we did here that most people may not appreciate until I pointed out, when you print those material onto your t-shirt, you actually change the material property of the fabric because the print is stiffer. And this will also reflect that. Um, and, and we also try on extreme cases where very skinny body wearing very large t-shirt. Um, when you shipping real things, you have to test all different kind of scenario. And this was the two-tone dresses I mentioned earlier, where you can really see the clothes draped differently for the blue parts and the white part of the dress. And, and again, if you don't have the material adjustment, they don't drape exactly like you might actually get from the real material. So it is important to get, actually get the material right. OK. All right, so there are still lots and lots of work to be done. Um, what we have started doing, I think that it opened the door to interactive high fidelity garment simulation. Uh, if we could do garment simulation of all different types, we are still not there 100% yet. Um, and then you also allow us to do automatic parameter selection based on the examples. So based on the data we have, like video, images, or drawing. Um, and we also started addressing the robustness issue in the body reconstruction. The body reconstruction is still a very hard problem. Just the camera angle variation, the lighting conditions, or even your skin tone. We have done some recent study. We were surprised. There are actually biases in these learning algorithms. Why? They are just machine, right? Yeah, they are just machine, but they are machine that was trained on the data. So the biases came from the data. So all these variations, even including skin tone, uh, the background, the lighting, all got baked in, in the data we provided. So it, it introduced all kind of biases in the algorithm. So when you heard about algorithm fairness, really we're talking about data fairness, whether the data are representative enough. Um, so of the population and whatever object you're trying to capture. So data-driven based approach uh, or database, uh, you know, data-driven approach have its problem because it depends on how good your data collections are and how good the samples are. Um, 
And then we've also been looking at an end-to-end -end differentiable framework using differentiable rendering geometry and simulation for recovery and reconstruction of the whole entire object pipeline. And this is work in progress, but I think it has a lot of tremendous potential. We focus largely on physics so far. We started to looking into differentiable geometry and, and also rendering. And rendering was critical, even though we are not reinventing the wheel on the rendering side, but rendering was critical because uh, at the end of the day, all we have is the example that we use to match the simulated result and the original data. So if our rendering is not great, then we may not get the perfect match as well due to the rendering methodology. That's why we need this entire integrated pipeline, differentiable rendering, geometry, and simulation. Um, and I'm hoping going forward to the future, this is going to enable all of us to do customized design however we like. And then we can have smart printing, smart fabric, and Hopefully, we'll get to the point where we can have the clothes exactly we want. Um, so uh, this is make me very happy. So I don't have to go shopping. I can do it at home. Anyhow, I'm continuing on this bandwagon and of, of doing everything digital. And well, not really. It's really metaverse. Human is always in the center. So I'm going to talk a bit about multi-agent systems. Many things in the world that we live in are all multi-agent system. This including us, human crowd, human crowd and um, smart cities, for example, you know, this is the concept that has been around. We are all connected. We are all sense wire with phones and everything. And so we want to reconstruct a city and we want to reconstruct the crowds. So there has been a lot of work actually in this area where there are prior data-driven approach that are really doing all kind of motion data collection from mocap tracking. There's a lot, a lot of computer vision work in this area. Um, and also lots and lots of work in computer graphics that have been looking at data-driven crowd simulation. Um, and then a lot of this is all done offline. Ideally, what we want is to create an ultimate metaverse is we want an online process where we can take a single view or a single videos uh, from some existing online library or real time streaming and be able to process the data uh, possibly from surveillance camera from a different angle and be able to process and, and, and generate information or extract the information we, we need. Um, and so this was one of the vision that imagine that you have a video of a train station and you have people walking around. Um, and you can reconstruct the same scene, but why do you want to do that? Well, you may want to ask the what if question. What if I put a Christmas tree there during the holiday? Um, and how would this affect the crowd flow? Um, what if there is a little fires or unexpected events? Um, and, and what if I want to change the stall so that people might come in and out differently during traffic hours or rush hours and so on? So that's the basic idea. And so we want to be able to get some data directly from the video. And so this is a real world videos, real, you know, crowd video. Trajectory of each are being extracted. You can see that it's anonymized, so you can even really identify the people. What we were really focusing on here is their, their, their trajectory. And they are very, very noisy. Based on these trajectory, we regenerate a virtual human. And again, they are anonymized, so privacy is not an issue. So we use our, our simulated crowd. We also started looking into, can we model people differently? We look at how the personality would affect the emotions. And we've done some user study on this. We even use a psychological model to build these different personality model. And again, as I already mentioned earlier, our focus is our human. And so, so you know, they are really human centric. So we want to be able to get all this information. Um, and this enable us to figure out how these kind of information allow us to arrange things in the train station, for example. Um, we also in inserted um, the you know, behavior model, as I already mentioned earlier. And one of the reasons we are interested in doing that is to figure out how people might react differently under special circumstances. So that was a YouTube video we extracted, reconstructed. This is the virtual version of that YouTube video uh, as they cross the street. Um, and so now something, a little explosion happened, they start running away. So this, this kind of you know, tools allow us to ask the what if, question, what if question. If you have an explosion or you have unexpected events, what can you do? How should you redesign your environment such that you can uh, achieve safe um, evacuation and so on? Um, and you can imagine that is not limited to human, even though um, you know, the demonstration application and the behavior modeling all human-centric. 
Um, autonomous driving is a really hot area right now. There are about like 50 different companies in Bay Area all on working on autonomous driving of one phone or the other. Um, I'm sure they are not all going to survive, but meanwhile, it generates a lot of job and economy. But you know, people ask me, do, do I believe autonomous driving is going to be there for us tomorrow? And I would say it is already there. Look at your car. Uh, you already have a lot of features. It may not be 100% autonomous, but all the research that has been done on autonomous driving are now becoming feature in your car, make your driving safer. It's able to do lane detections, preventing collisions, um, and you can hands off. It would do very small, you know, autonomous uh, cruising already on the straight road for you, and it's smart enough that when you put on the paddle and when you take your foot off, it will still continue. It's not going to stop. Um, and so there's a lot of smart features that we already are benefiting from autonomous driving. So whether we're going to have a 100% autonomous driving car, it's difficult to say, but the technology has already benefited us a lot. And I want to say that even for autonomous driving, one of the things that we have learned is a lot of these drivings are learning directly from real driver's behaviors. However, one of the things is the driver will not get him or herself into accident. You can count on that. They want to be a safe driver. So most of the scenario collected are all safe driving. Then how do you ever learn from bad driving? How does a car ever learn from bad driving? So one of the things that we have been working on is, can we actually, and also what about traffic? How does traffic around you affect your driving? So one of the things that we have been working on is what we call virtualized traffic reconstruction. We've been trying to reconstruct traffic flow directly um, from traffic data. And this enable us to basically use sensory information to reconstruct the traffic flow that we can import it either into things like Google Earth or some other form of autonomous driving simulator. And what you are seeing on the right is a camera view of the driver. And what you see on the top is an overview of what's going on. And, and you can see that um, you know, it's already much better than without. And this is all automatically um, recreated from um, just the sensor data. So I'm going to, that was trying to show congestion being formed. Um, and, and this can also handle arbitrary complex um, road network, uh, things like over ramp, um, freeway, connected freeway pathway, and so on. Um, and you can also change the driver's viewpoint depending on, um, you know, if you want to use it as a simulator. Now, I have a lot of problem with looking at this. I get motion sick because this is from the driver's perspective. Um, and, and you can see, you know, this is kind of like an on-ramp of, of ramp, on ramp getting emerged onto existing traffic. So it is already possible to do this. And, and there are all different methods. We have continued to work on this area, and we have validated many of our results. Uh, yeah, this paper was published in Eurographics, so we have Eurographics on the road, on the sign. Anyhow, there, there are a lot, lots and lots of interesting things that can be done, but what we were really trying to do is reconstruct traffic directly. We have used, developed different approaches over time, um, and we are hoping uh, to incorporate some of these traffic information to train an autonomous car. So one of the things that we, are try we have shown in one of our more recent paper is teach the autonomous vehicle how not to drive. And that is, we actually literally generate accidental scenarios and by analyzing the trajectory of the accidents of the vehicle, we use those parameters to teach the car how to steer away from the, um, the obstacles. So in light of time, however, I realize I am taking a little bit longer than expected. Sorry, when I start talking. So just to show you very quickly, so the accident would generate all kind of interesting point where the collision occur. And so we use those data that is automatically annotated from the trajectory that we collected. The, the autonomous vehicle is able to learn. Like if you have an obstacle coming uncertainly, how should you steer yourself and how should you control the car? So this is where, um, you know, we actually compared against public um, driver, driving simulator out there and it's able to show that with our approach on the left, it's able to steer the obstacles much better versus the standard driving simulator just fell off the road and crashed onto um, the, the sideway. 
So, and again, these are just sort of examples to show you how he was able to avoid the obstacle after he learned how not to drive. Okay. And there are more scenarios. We show the scenario we actually generated on purpose for these collisions. All of these slides will be examples from the accident simulator along with So we're literally trying to generate all kinds of scenario, like the one that I just showed you, to crash the car into each other. So, um, and then after that, you know how to avoid a car when you, when you see and, you know, a car coming. Okay. All right. So that is the basic idea. Uh, and I want to say that the approach that we did, whether it is crowd or vehicles, these are all multi-agent systems. The concept of multi-agent system actually include, it extends to nature as well, like insects, like animals, um, and the same kind of approach. People are very interested in capturing, believe it or not, the motions of birds and fish and animal in nature and even insects because it captures the group behaviors. And there has been also data-driven modeling approach for these insects and animals as well. Um, I just show a few examples there. Lastly, but not at least, I'm going to quickly and talk about multimodal display. I think many of us here in graphics or visualization or VR, we all know the importance of multimodality. And so far, I have still only focused largely in my talk on the visual elements. Um, and I do want to acknowledge somebody who have worked on both audio and haptics that it is important to actually look at other, other modality as well. And I hope this example uh, get to serve what, what's important. And we need to think about how do you take the visual information and extend it to other modality. And, and this is what this particular example is showing. Um, I realize it doesn't have the audio. Um, yeah, that's one, one of the things I was trying to do. Um, the simulation you saw, that was actually a physics simulation. Underlying the geometry was only a flat plane. On top of it, it was just a texture information. And so based on the texture, we were able to extract um, pseudo geometry and run the simulation. Now, unfortunately, the audio is not here. Uh, I'm not hearing the audio. Um, but that images you saw, it's a Lombard Street in San Francisco. If you haven't visited this place in San Francisco, you should next time. Generally speaking, there are cars driving down that road, that, that winding road. I love Lombard Street. Every time I go to San Francisco, I always visit Lombard Street. Um, but instead of a car, we let the ball just roll down the street. Automatically, if there is sound, you would actually hear the ball rolling as well. And the physics and simulation and everything is all done just from a single view images. And this one is even cooler because this one is also a texture images. And again, like I say, we need to think about going from visual to other fidelity. By using the normal map, we are able to extract the normal information. The normal information is able to allow us to haptically manipulate the ball and stop wherever there is a, like a cracks or grooves. Um, and if you, if I have the sound, you would actually be able to hear the sound as the ball rolls on different surfaces. And so this is going from visual to multimodality, and it's really important. With a haptic device, you can even feel what, what you're actually feeling. Now, we did a perceptual study, and we show for this particular experiment to indicate and trying to distinguish different kind of surfaces with all modes on, it's the easiest. And not only that, we also found haptic was very critical for identifying different type of surfaces. Going on um, is to talk about, um, unfortunately, audio extraction. Um, wait, it does have some. Okay. So you heard an audio sample that was taken. And we, based on the audio recording we had, we were automatically able to extract the features that represent the metallic of a xylophone. Then we apply that parameter to the virtual xylophone. All the things that you saw was all recorded in real time. The user was playing the virtual xylophone with the material you heard. And so this is the kind of a virtual instrument that we would love to be able to create automatically. Um, let me see if this is going to work. I don't know if you can hear. This was actually one of our grad students created a virtual drums. He's a drummer and, and a, you know, amateur drummer, but he was able to play the, the virtual drum. Our system handles a large number of touches, sound synthesis, and acoustic simulation for okay, multiple sounding is controlling, bodies all okay. in real time. This makes it ideal for musical pieces played by multiple users. Okay. She doesn't know, however, to play the xylophone. 
and those two play together, it's kind of off the tune, but you get the idea. It's a collaborative musical instrument. So you can actually create your own instruments and play together and have fun. All right. Now, even better yet, if you are able to get the material, you can create this virtual instrument actually doesn't exist. Um, my grad students create this by clicking the bar, generating the string. And obviously, he doesn't have a music gene either. But you can see, you don't need a music gene to play this instrument. Um, so you can create these kind of, of musical devices on your, your you know, laptop um, or iPad. And you can see this instrument doesn't exist because it has the funny bars on the side. Again, created by graduate students, but automatically, interactively to work with you. And this is the kind of the metaverse that we like to share the experience with. Um, so anyway, audiovisual are they work together nicely. Other than creating musical instrument, it can also be used to create a room with lots of mirrors and windows. Those are typically very difficult for visual reconstruction, um, and and you can also be used for um, you know generating all kind of audiovisual effects. Going into the future, I believe that if we can use some of these acoustic friendly design. Um, it can help us do better building design, extracting material for, you know, with a machine learning algorithm to generating new instruments and, and various type of building um, constructions. And lastly, but not at least, is I, be I believe this kind of ability is going to allow us to improve our telling immersion experiences um, so that we could bring people here next to us through this tele immersion experience. And if nothing else, I'm hoping we'll have better Zoom experience. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to end right here by just saying here, like a lot of work I share here are very much multidisciplinary in nature. And it's a collaboration with people with geometry background, physics, machine learning, uh, vision, statistical processing, uh, data sciences, and psychoacoustic and cognitive sciences. And so working this area really, really need people's help. Um, it, there's still a lot more to be done. And as I already have mentioned, I, I get my pitch that we really need to think about combinations and you know integrating data-driven based approach and also uh, model-based approach, which we have already spent decades of effort and research on. And so that has been what we've been looking at is these physical model bringing into the deep neural network and integrate them together. This is a kind of paradigm also work for um, just, you know, that, that has been explored in the machine learning framework and they call the neural ODE. Uh, and it's applicable not just in graphics and virtual environment and vetomers. It can be used for control and dynamics of robot designs, uh, soft robot material designs, um, simulating articulated soft bodies. In the most recent work, I have worked with one of my colleagues in quantum computing. And some of these principles apply there as well. All right, and I'm going to end right here and just simply say, um, you know, there are a lot of really exciting future directions. And I, I hope this only sort of, you know, start a conversation that we can have. Uh, I'd love to chat with anyone else afterwards. And, um, and, and this is, by the way, I'm going to end with this. This is a um, combining and bringing neural physics, um, and we call it new physics. Um, basically, we're introducing edible neural geometry and physics from molecular video. It's a combination of everything I talk about integrated with NERF. And um, so we are hoping to achieve more photorealistic uh, environment as well through this uh, particular approach. All right. And I'm going to end right here and maybe take question. I just Thank realized. you. Thank you, very impressive body of work. Uh, I'm really fascinated. Are there questions to me here? Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, was that melody played, uh, written by Haydn, the only music <laughs> composer who is buried with two heads? No. No, it was just okay. played by my grass students. You, okay. you mean which one? The the one that. Okay, thank you. I think it was just, thank you. It I was will, just played I, by my grass I will students. search after. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions? Is there? Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. 
Uh, I have to say that I myself is, uh, am also a very haptic person. And when you were talking about virtual try-ons, so what about haptic feedbacks? Are yeah. we anywhere near or do you know any group who is working on this? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that was definitely one of the things that um, my boss at Amazon have um, been asking. And unfortunately, there is no devices that we have because... Um, Fabric material is, uh, as some of you know, I mean, I don't know, depending on how picky you are, I am very picky. Um, unfortunately, that was one thing we don't currently have. The, the haptic material, the haptic sense, um, it's not there. And, um, and, and, and I think, you know, I'm hoping, what, what I have, uh, having worked on the software algorithms and systems for haptic rendering for more than a decade, um, I realize Software is easier than the hardware. <laughs> you know, mechanism and, and machine and hardware, it's just so hard, it's such a hard problem. And it was really the, the bottleneck. And, but, but I know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, people are designing new material as we speak. And, and I'm also very uh, hopeful that if we can bring some of these computational tools for new material design, we might be a little, I mean, I know there are people who've been looking at haptic vests, haptic gloves, uh, haptic gloves is not anywhere close. Um, but but I'm, I am um, sort of excited about soft robotics, which is another really uh, you know, exciting area that are developing. Along with computational material, we might be able to start feeling material that, are, that we wear, but we are not there yet. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, right now, our virtual try-on is still very much very visual. But at least we're trying to incorporate the physics and we're trying to incorporate the fit. Because uh, for me, without a fitting, there's just really image-based approach doesn't work there. It has to be, virtual try-on has to be 3D. The 2D virtual try-on would not work because our body are different. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, over there. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Um, my question is, do you try to estimate the accurate scale when you try to capture the, the clothes from a picture or from a video? And yeah, if yes, how? Yeah, we, we did. I mean, we, we have the clothes on the videos that are being used to infer the material property. So we actually use that as also a validation as well. So we, we have the, like I say, we have our, our own engineers try on clothes and we use the video to infer the material property which we use to simulate. And after we've done the simulation, we, have, we check to see if the simulated result actually compared to the, the video input, whether they match or not. So we did do that. Um, I have to say that currently we are not doing it. We are not trying, one of the things that I did not say was what we have found that was really interesting in our algorithm is we found that the wrinkles is the visual cue that I use for the matching. And if you think about it, different fabric actually wrinkle differently. And also our joints information, our body poses matter a lot. Because if you look at your clothes or you know, your neighbor's um, clothes and the wrinkle where they occur, it's very much driven by your body poses and your body shape. Um, and also very importantly on the, on the, on the seam. Um, so the stitching also matters, and and the fabric material will create that unique wrinkle based on the poses, and that's kind of how the machine is able to identify the material from those wrinkle information. So there's actually a wrinkle counting going on there, the wrinkle density information being used. Okay. Yeah, Over thank there. you. Yeah, there's... Um, have you thought about material and noises they make? Because some people are sensitive to noises that the materials make. Because I don't know, they have a. Oh no, we haven't thought about that. And That's also, a really. I, I bought some shoes and then I went, I walked, and they make stupid noises. <laughs> so you can, okay. you can think about. I don't know. In my office, there is always this floor, and I don't want to have the shoes with the floor. I don't know. Some people are sensitive Great. to this. I, I, I appreciate it. No, we have not thought about it, but I'll make sure I'll bring it back to the Amazon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and my group it does, it's also looking at the, the shoes, and I've been advocating fit as the number one issue. But I totally agree with you. The noise is about the clothes that may, we, we, haven't, we haven't thought about that. Uh, that's a really interesting perspective. And we certainly did not think about the sound that the shoes made. And Excellent. We need to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that will be, you know, I mean, we, we are looking at virtual trial on 
different perspective shoes and garments and also glasses. So glassware, eyewear, jewelry and all. Yes. Okay. I, I have a last question and then we go to lunch. <laughs> so um, is there any quantification already on the amount of CO2 you could uh, save by avoiding shipping of wrong clothes Even because better. of your application to, to demonstrate the impact? That's a really good question. Uh, I think we can look into it. And that's going to be a, a criteria that we're going to include in our, um, our um, basically our reward function next mm -hmm. time when we design our neural network. <laughs> so it will be one of, of our uh, matrix to optimize mm -hmm. for. So, okay. Yes, but no, we haven't done that yet. But yeah. I think if we can quantify that, that will be you know tremendous, and yeah, we can convince the Amazon management we need to do more. Yeah, and save Mark, the environment. You know, Marco Camia from the Unido, which was in our uh, Visual uh, Computing Award Committee, also he was emphasizing again very much the importance of these simulations. Uh, to save because the impact is huge. Yes, yes, I it's totally agree. It's expected to be huge on, on our climate and because the clothes industry is so, so big, uh, people are delivering so much clothes in fast fashion and optimizing this process is uh, would have a high impact. So I think your work is really important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's time for lunch. Thank you.